Hello again, this is my first uh, proper video, full video, um, and we'll be talking about the history of humans in Europe. We'll be starting right at the beginning, uh, before the emergence of Neanderthalensis, our cousins with whom we in Europe uh, are mixed. Uh, so, Heidelbergensis um, arises probably from Homo antecessor and probably in Africa, though it has been found uh, in various subspecies in Europe and in Africa. Um, in, and, it, and it also moved further east. Uh, in the east it became the Denisova hominin, which is mixed with Asians and Australoids. In Europe it became, in Europe and in Central Asia, it became Neanderthalensis. Is mixed with again with Europeans and with especially with Amerindians and also with Asians to some degree and, and Australoids. Um, <clears throat> so in Africa it became Rhodesiensis, which is proposed as the common human ancestor with, with the Neanderthal uh, via uh, Idaltu. Uh, there's also a subspecies called Daliensis, which I presume is another of the African subspecies. I wasn't able uh, I'm not able currently to find the information on that particular find. Uh, in, in Europe, there's a transitional Heidelbergensis fossil, which has uh, traits both of Neanderthalensis and Heidelbergensis, which is called Steinheimensis, uh, based on the, the one find of the type in, in Steinheim. Um, it's, as I said, it's transitional between the two. Uh, Neanderthal is supposed to have emerged around 400,000 uh, years before the present time. So the Steinheimensis is in that transitional period when uh, Denisovan had already, or was beginning to, depending on, on the theory, we, because we only have one transitional find, it's hard to establish exactly whether it was ancestral to Neanderthal and was the transition, or whether it was a, a separate European Denisovan that was uh, replaced by a more advanced, um, or more successful Neanderthal population. So Neanderthals uh, latest and most advanced stage of tool dev development, uh, their most, most prominent uh, tool culture, is known as the Mysterian. Um, it's, it's a certain form of um, sharply shaped rock. It's a, it's a, a superb technique for sharpening, sharpening rock shapely. Uh, it emerged around 1,600 years before the present, so that's fairly late in Neanderthal development, um, and yeah, I, when I cover this in more detail, because I'm going to cover each section of this video, there are four sections, four main sections, and then there's additional section, an additional section at the end. Uh, this will be a section on archaic hominids, uh, focusing on the Neanderthal, and when I talk about this, I'm just going to give you a little, a little teaser now, because uh, I will be talking more about the Eastern Neanderthal um, as well as the European Neanderthal because the Eastern Neanderthal actually seems to have been uh, the main ancestor uh, responsible for the Neanderthal genes in, in the human genome and um, it, the fossil types actually show convergent evolution which is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, so it begins to show uh, Homo sapiens like traits in certain aspects uh, with regards to the face before it's, it is uh, then absorbed into the Homo sapiens population. Uh, right. So we move on then to the entry of Homo sapiens into Europe and the Cro Magnon type um, was a type with Neanderthal hybridization in the Levant, it emerged around 40,000 years before present, uh, bearing in mind that humans had left Africa around 60,000 years before present time. So that leaves them in Southwest Asia for 20,000. And then in the Northern Levant, this type arrives. The first, uh, the earliest finds of the type, some of the earliest finds are at School Kavse in Northern Israel. Uh, and they're very interesting specimens. They're Cro-Magnons. They show show clear Neanderthal traits, and I think traces of Neanderthal have been found in their DNA. But with DN with Neanderthal DNA, one has to remember that uh, we us one the one time we sequenced the Neanderthal genome was largely unsuccessful. If you read the um, 
If you read the reports on the study, they declared it a success, but you can see that they had problems um, both with uh, bacterial contamination and possibly with human contamination. And I suspect that um, they isolated more of the genes that were shared in the, in the scientists who were um, working with it and they've therefore deselected certain uh, parts of the genome automatically without knowing whether they were really shared. Uh, but if you see, if you look at the study, they had to patch the DNA back together because it was contaminated by bacteria. So they took it apart piece by piece and put it together like a mosaic. It's not, it, from my understanding, it's not a very accurate uh, method for sequencing a genome. Um, I will cover it in a later video and I'll do some more study on it again. I have, I have read the, the research. Um, and come to my conclusions in the past, but as I say, I will cover that separately. Um, so, so that's just a note to be wary uh, when someone says there's one to four percent, for example, in uh, Neanderthal in the Eurasian genome, which was actually a figure that was revised down all over the internet, which is highly suspicious. But that's a separate issue again. So back to Cro-Magnon. Um, Cro-Magnon carried three major DNA groups. That's C6. Now, C6 is a separate branch of a lineage that is present in uh, Asia and Northwest Amerindians. So it's present in the Den speakers, and it was uh, the major group of the Man Manchu, um, uh, more or less extinct or assimilated uh, people that dominated China for a long, long part of modern uh, history. Um, so... Yeah, so C6 is more or less extinct. I think it exists in a few refugia in, in a certain percentage of the population, but it, it's not even 1% uh, of the European population. Uh, F, again, uh, doesn't exist in that form. F, F was uh, Ilamo Dravidian, if you like, because uh, and, and also uh, Proto-Caucasian. The Caucasians are G, which descends from F, and the, which is why they have a Torrid uh, phenotype, which is a, it's a it's a certain kind of Cro-Magnon phenotype. And H, the Dravidians, again, you can see the Cro-Magnon influence in the Dravidians, but the Dravidians are, uh, they have part of an Australoid branch, but the Australoids descended from Proto-Caucasoids as well, so that they have a, uh, a link to Cro-Magnon is not so surprising. And then IJ, which is the main, the main haplotype where we're concerned, because IJ split into two branches and the the northern branch that ventured into Europe became I, which is the main proto-European paternity. It's the main European paternity uh, everywhere in Europe until the Neolithic expansion from the Mediterranean and the Aryan invasions from the steppe to the to the northeast. Um, Indo-European invasions, it, it means the same thing, uh, but I decided I'd use that term uh, to prevent controversy. It means exactly the same thing. So, uh, yes, so then the mtDNA uh, they carried, uh, they carried U2, they carried U5, they carried HV, and that's also H and V. H is still the main uh, European maternity today, and V is one of the major paternities alongside it in the east of Europe. Uh, so we have a good chunk of uh, Cro-Magnon inheritance, uh, all of us as Europeans. The Western hunter-gatherer, which is the autosomal element, uh, the autosomes are the rest of the genes, so that's everything but the sex chromosomes, it's the majority of our genes. Um, there's an autosomal element called Western hunter-gatherer, which is essentially the Cro-Magnon um, DNA. It's up to 50% of genes in the Baltic, where, it's, where it peaks. Uh, it's 35 to 45% uh, through the rest of Northern Europe. It's 30 to 35 percent in Central Europe, uh, 10 to 30 percent, depending on the location in the Western Med. Uh, if I say Med, I just mean Mediterranean. I, uh, sorry, we use we use terms and abbreviations and things in the anthropological community that most of us understand, but I don't want to obscure anything for uh, people new to the subject because I wouldn't want your uh, interest to diminish because finding out where we came from. Uh, is part of finding out where we're going, and that's that's very important uh, to my mind. So, uh, yeah, so uh, southern Italy, Greece, and the Balkans, um, Western hunter-gatherer DNA is less than ten percent, so there it's it's much less significant. 
Right, that's, that concludes the section on the Cro-Magnon Man. There's a lot more to say, but as I said, I will cover uh, each of these in a separate video. I'll cover Archaic Hominins in one, I'll cover Cro-Magnon Man in one. And then I'll cover this next section, which is, is twofold. It's the Neolithics, uh, who were a Mediterranean people group who expanded from the Near East, and the Megalithic culture, which is very interesting to many, many people. Uh, it's the culture of standing stones. Uh, the Stonehenge is the most famous. Uh, I think everyone knows Stonehenge. Uh, Stonehenge was one of these monuments. So the megaliths and the Neolithics um, were likely spread by the same people. They, they overlapped, they begin at the same time. Um, the, the earliest megalith is one that was found more recently than a lot. Uh, it's Gobek, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. It's a huge megalithic complex, um, one of the biggest, or perhaps the biggest, not confident there. Um, then in, in 6000, uh, there are three, uh, there are two sites in Portugal, Almendres Kromlech and Evora. Uh, by 5000, it's spread throughout the Atlantic. Um, it's a period called the Atlantic Neolithic. Uh, by 4000, it's reached Britain. So then monuments like Stonehenge uh, and Stonehenge itself come about. I'm, I'm not entirely sure on the dating of Stonehenge, but I'll cover it and other monuments when I cover this section specifically. So then the Neolithic expansion, the peoples who brought the megaliths as well as farming. Um, that is agrarian farming because uh, herding um, was largely brought uh, in terms of cattle by the Indo-Europeans, which I'll get to in the next period of European history. The Neolithic expansion reaches the, Mediter the European Mediterranean from the Near East uh, in about 6000 BC. Uh, in, by 4500 it's reached mo much of the interior of the continent. By 3500 it's become dominant in the British Isles, but not stretched to the whole uh, yet. It's still, still um, only in a few sites in Ireland and in about half of the UK. Uh, it's then, it then spreads to the North Sea and the Southern Baltic regions by 3000 BC. But there it didn't leave uh, anywhere near as much of a trace because especially not in uh, the Y DNA. The Y DNA of uh, these cultures tends to be G, J, and E. I should have said that the other way around. J, E, and G. Uh, and they didn't make much of an impact on the north of Europe in terms of Y DNA. They're very minor clades, and uh, some, of, some of that is, is borrowings from other peoples. Um, but the culture was present for a short while before the Bronze Age invasions, which also start at 3000 BC. Um, so just as the, just as the farmers are attempting to settle in the north of Europe, the Indo-Europeans start invading from the steppe. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, so then, so the early European uh, autosomal elements, same autosomes I talked about earlier, the majority of the genetics, uh, it peaks in Northern Arabia and Sicily, actually, even though it's called the European, early European farmer. Uh, and that shows the, the recent Levantine uh, origin of the genetic element, because that's where the Neolithic began. Uh, it's up to 40% in Northern Europe, depending on the area and the individual. Uh, it's 40 to 50% in Central Europe, so it's almost balanced with the other elements, the Proto-European and Indo-European. Uh, and it's higher in Mediterraneans. It peaks above 80 in Spain, Italy and Greece. And in and Sicily, it's actually upwards of 90% uh, by averages. So. That's that section, so that, again, we'll cover these two later. Now the next thing we come to is the Indo-European invasion, the one you've all been waiting for, the one that lends us uh, our languages, uh, among other things. Our languages, the wheel, um, and yeah, various other things, the Bronze Age in Europe largely. So, um, advanced metallurgy, though it was already present, metallurgy was already present, and um, the wheel and herding 
other languages. So uh, these peoples, um, they were of two two main paternities, or two paternities really, R1A and R1B. Uh, R1A is what's found in both Indians and Slavs and also some Northern Europeans uh, and others through them. Uh, R1B is what's mainly found in Europeans and also in Armenians and historically in a people group called Tocharians who lived in the northwest of China, but they, they are long extinct, though they leave some influence on the, on the Uyghur population, the, the Muslim population of uh, northwest China. So, um, in Europe, yeah, these people, the Corded Ware civilization is largely R1A, which is interesting. We'll, we'll cover, um, because because it, this, this one fa is responsible for the founding of Germanic culture, even though Germanics are largely R1B. So continental Germanics formed through a fusion of the Hallstatt culture, which is proto-Celtic of Central Europe, and the Jarstorf culture, which um, or descended from the Nordic Bronze Age, which was the Court of Ware. Sorry about that. Uh, and then, yeah, so almost exclusively R1B and R1A, depending on which uh, branch of the civilization. And we have uh, two, two different sets of European languages called Centum and Sartum which more or less correspond uh, to that split. Uh, and I'll talk about those again in more detail in a future video. I2A2 was the main paternity of continental Northern Europe, all the way from Russia across to the West Coast. Um, and it, uh, as, as a result, it was one of the early um, paternities that was absorbed, absorbed in minor quantities. We have to remember the Indo-Europeans were um, a patriarchal people, uh, their, their chiefs, their, the higher castes, the priests, and the, um, especially the, the warrior princes took many wives. Uh, so there's not much of the native paternity that remained in a lot of the countries, especially the, the earlier countries that they invaded. Uh, but I2A2A was the first absorbed, so there is some of it present. Uh, and then the other one is Q. Now, yeah, Q is interesting because it could be in association with other steppe peoples, but it could also be a result of the fact that R1A and R1B have a common root with Q in the northern branch of P, which I'll talk about, I'll make a whole video about that, because that's a very interesting population bottleneck that feeds into ancient North Eurasians, the people group that, that uh, Indo-Europeans and Amerindians both descend from. Um, <coughs> so... Their mtDNA, their major mtDNAs uh, were each of these having over 20%, belonging to over 20% of the maternities, uh, UK, uh, H and T. UK, in UK, the U5 and K clades are both major, whereas the U4 and U2 clades are present as outliers. Uh, then in T, uh, T2 is the most prevalent and T1 uh, is less prevalent but still significant. Uh, there was minor J. J was up to and over in some in some groups, like the quadruple. It was over ten percent of maternities. And then we come to the outliers, I X and W. I X and W are very peculiar maternities. They already existed in Europe uh, by that point. Uh, a quick note on I. I had come from seems to have come from East Africa earlier, uh, so that was one of the first. The movements into Europe that isn't really mentioned here because it's a minor movement um, in terms of looking at genetics. Um, yeah, and I'll cover X uh, in another video about something called the Salutrian Hypothesis, which was a movement of peoples from uh, the area around Anatolia um, to Iberia, historically, although it's no longer present there, and then even all the way across across to Amerindia. So it was the first settlement um, of Amerindia, and it shows in the, in the peoples there. First settlement of Amerindia from the west, that is. Um, right, so what have we got? Ancient North Eurasian. Okay, so this is the element um, 
that was about half of the makeup of uh, the ancient Indo-Europeans, the Proto-Indo-Europeans were just about half, maybe a little more than half uh, ancient North Eurasian, with the rest being um, Proto-Eurasian uh, Proto uh, kind of hunter and hunter-gatherer lines that were absorbed. Uh, <clears throat> ancient North Eurasian element actually peaks in Amerindians, who, as I said, are descended from the same people in, as Indo-Europeans. Um, so, uh, in some areas and individuals in Europe, this element is over 20%. Uh, it's even higher in, in certain bits of the Caucasus. Uh, it's also quite high in bits of Central Asia and north of India. Uh, in Northern Europe at large, it's over 50%, 15%, up to 15%. Yeah, 15%. Uh, in Central Europe, it's over 12%. Um, and in... The Mediterranean, uh, it ranges a lot from from five to about ten. Uh, Bar Sardinia, where it's even less than five. Right, so that covers. Oh no no no! One last thing, which is the event that ended this Bronze Age that the uh, Indo-European invasions ushered in. Uh, it's an event called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, which sees. Um, I'll go into it. In detail but it's a, it's a depopulation of population centers a shift in culture um, and uh, people uh, a group of people groups um, called the sea peoples group a confederation of different tribes uh, mostly from the Middle East but also from Greece uh, and elsewhere um, seems to have been largely responsible for this or at least they they helped it on the way once it had begun began begun but I'll go into the theories surrounding the whole event in, in the later video, at the end of the video on the Indo-European period. Um, so this period is what we owe all European languages except Basque and Sami, if one counts it, uh, to. Um, and even the Sami and the Basque have Indo-European lineages. The Basque have almost exclusively R1B, Indo-European paternity, and the Sami have a huge amount, actually higher than <laughs> than the people of European paternities. They have they have the most European maternity. So despite usually being classed alongside uh, Mongoloids and East Asians, they have substantive European um, maternity and even autosomes. Right, on to... Okay, so now we go on to uh, sort of outlying, outlying things. This is, this is the end of the the main section of the video and these are um, these are more minor groups so first the first thing the main thing I want to address in this section is uh, the paternal haplotype N N is associated with the Uralics and I have a friend who strongly contests this shout out to shout out to him um, uh, I'll cover it. I'll cover it in a future video for sure. I'll research it in a lot of depth from both perspectives, and I'll give you the pros and the cons of the the Uralic uh, theory versus the the more mainstream theory. Um, so there's huge dispute over this the the time uh, that Uralic and Proto-Uralic came about. Uralic is thought to have developed sometime between 1000 BC and 1000 AD. 1000 AD is very late. I doubt it's that late. Uh, 1000 BC might be the case. It's still uh, late in comparison to the Aryan, uh, the Aryan invasion, the Aryan ethno, uh, Indo-European ethnogenesis. Um, a more conservative estimate was 150 AD, but this is the range. It's, it ranges a lot. Proto-Uralic uh, is thought to have been somewhere between 7,000 and 2,000, which again is quite vague. Uh, this is BC. Uh, their Heimat is not agreed upon, or Heimat, which is the place where a whole people group comes from, where the, the ethnogenesis, the uh, genesis of the ethnicity and the language, meta-ethnicity and the language group come from. Uh, it's thought to have been in the Ural Mountains. I mean, they're named for the same. Um, and they seem to have dispersed from there northwards and uh, to the west as well, certain groups. So, yeah, it's... Um, but, that ha that being said, uh, the high amount of the founding population of that group 
was probably in East Asia because and this is part of the dispute but uh, the highest percentage of N as a paternity is in northern China uh, followed by the northernmost reaches of Eurasia uh, and the highest the highest clade diversity is actually in Mongolia not, not far over the border from from the North China North Chinese um, area where the paternity dominates most strongly um, <clears throat> yeah so although it's likely Uralic uh, there is a culture called the Pitcomb ware culture um, it's a type of ceramic a lot of the cultures are named for their style of ceramics so there there was clearly a Uralic and Indo-European fusion uh, sometime before 2000 BC which was the end of this cultural period it was in the late stages of this period for sure uh, given given that we found finds uh, of the culture that are entirely Indo-European uh, so as the culture progressed certain elements of the culture or the culture at large seem to have uh, assimilated the, the Uralic, the Phoenix specifically populations on their periphery uh, and yes yeah, so it's Estonians, Livonians, Ingrians they adopted Uralic uh, whereas the Latvian, Lithuanian, and Latgalians, who are also uh, of very similar genetics, uh, almost the same autosomally, and uh, you can see the you can see the decline in paternity, where there's more Finnic in the north and more uh, Indo-European in the south, um, but they they're cousins, they're related, uh, and the old Prussians too. Before they were assimilated into the German and uh, Polish populations. Uh, the Old Prussians were a separate uh, Baltic group. Um, so, there we got. Yeah, so the Baltoslavic population is what is what the the latter of those became the Latvian, Lithuanian, Latgalian, Old Prussian. Um, so, I would guess, I would hazard a guess, and again, I'll, I'll try to look into it in a lot more detail in future, but I would hazard a guess that the northern uh, areas of Bitcoin culture became uh, Uralic Finnic speakers, whilst the southern branches remained Indo-European speakers. Now we get, come to Q. Q is interesting because, as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, Q was an outlier in a couple of the, or in, in one rather, of the Indo-European, early Indo-European cultural sites, but it may have been introduced uh, to them through association with other step, step peoples, or it may have been introduced to Europe later with the Hunnic dominance, Hunnic dominance and Hunnic invasions. Uh, it's it peaks in uh, Sweden, eastern France, and then it has a period, uh, an area where it is present uh, minorly throughout uh, Eastern Europe. So yeah, another interesting thing to look into. Other minor influences. So, other obviously, uh, we have had um, Jews have been resident in Europe for a long time. We've had trade relations with various others. Uh, Moors, Moorish Arabs conquered both the whole of Iberia, Iberia before the Visigoths pushed them back, uh, and they made their mark on Andalusia, especially, and Sicily as well was conquered by the Arabs for a period of history. Uh, the Moorish Arabs. And then the Ottomans obviously have dominated the Balkan region and Greece for uh, you know quite some time. So those are those are all all uh, areas where Europeans kind of been influenced from this place or that place. But none of these are as significant, uh, even even slightly, as the historical events I've mentioned. Uh, so then, okay, then we come to today. This is really a side note. It's not part of the main video because it's not historical anthropology that I want to focus on. But um, pointing out the change in the situation today, I'd say there are there are much larger populations of other major races there have never been in in Europe, um, other than certain parts having a little uh, interaction with Mongoloids. There has been none, um, and a little influence in. Of, of the Negroid population on the south, but very minor. Um, 
so yeah, and there's also a growing mixed race population. I mean, it's the it's the fastest growing demographic in London by a long way. For for one example, um, there's also more inter-European mixture than priority, especially among the lower class, since the middle class have always had some level of mobility and are mixed, especially between related nations, but across Europe as a whole, and the upper classes have always been a mix of all European abilities. So, so yeah, really the the, the roots the roots of the peoples uh, now have more access to mixture within the continent. Um, yeah, uh, that's the end of this video. Any uh, suggestions or comments are more than welcome. I'll answer comments uh, and I will attempt to address any particular issues uh, in future videos. I'm sorry for the length of this. Most of my videos won't be quite this long, uh, but there was a lot to get through here. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, please like and sub and yeah, tell me what content you'd like to see because I want to make it as interesting to you guys as possible. Thank you very much. Ciao.